Perfect. Um, so I'm Blake Johnson. I'm the VP of Quantum Engineering at Rigetti. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about some of uh, our work on um, building quantum hardware that's available today for you to access over the cloud. Uh, so uh, Rigetti is maybe not a name that you are as familiar with as some of the other um, companies that are talking today. So let me just take a minute to tell you a little bit about um, Sorry, wrong thing. There we go. Uh, a little bit about us and, and about this hardware. So this is a, an image of, of one of our chips. This is a, a 19 qubit processor that we launched in December of last year. Uh, that came uh, roughly six months after our previous launch of an 8 qubit device uh, in June. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to continue this pace of introducing new product launches roughly every six months. Um, our company was uh, founded by Chad Rigetti in 2013. It's a venture-backed uh, venture startup. Uh, we're based in Berkeley, California, and we actually have two sites, uh, one in Berkeley and then a fab facility down in Fremont. Uh, we're at roughly about 100 employees now. Uh, and in addition to uh, this device, which you can access over the cloud, uh, we also have a high-performance uh, uh, quantum computing simulator which you can access uh, for free that simulates up to about 30 qubits. So uh, we are a full stack uh, quantum, uh, quantum computing company. You've uh, heard that term uh, several times today. When I'm saying it, I, I, mean, uh, uh, I, I mean that we work on, on various levels of the stack, not, not just the quantum processor or the control hardware that, that, that operates it, and not even just applications that run on the top of the stack. But we're also actively engaged in building uh, what is like a cloud operating system to make this accessible in, in, a, in a way which um, is compatible with uh, deploying with your applications. So uh, some, some pictures of our, of our facilities. This is our, our fabrication facility down in Fremont. Um, this may be, seem like an interesting choice for a startup to invest in, in a fab. Uh, we felt that this was important in order, to, in order to enable the kind of iterative development that we uh, believe is necessary to build this technology to fruition. So uh, using a typical semiconductor foundry process, which you could try to do to build uh, a superconducting uh, quantum processor, uh, would typically involve uh, timescales that are kind of on the orders of quarters or, or, or half years. Uh, and that just does not uh, allow us to, to turn the iteration cycle fast enough. Uh, having our own facility allows us to go from a, a design idea to an actual device in our lab in, in a matter of weeks. Um, so this uh, facility is on a weekly basis producing uh, devices that look like this. This is uh, a die carrying uh, with uh, several of our eight qubit processors. Uh, and we send those up to, to Berkeley uh, to our test facility uh, where those devices are characterized. Um, you can see that our facility has quite a bit of test capability, each one of these uh, things here is a dilution refrigerator uh, that gets down to about 10 millikelvin. Uh, and the actual, the 20 qubit device or the 19 qubit device that was on the, the second slide is, is kind of back in the corner here. Um, but uh, this team is uh, characterizing a lot of devices every week. Um, in addition to the quantum hardware, we spend a lot of effort on, on the software stack that uh, makes this available to you. So we call this collection of software tools Forest. And um, for us, in addition to giving you ac access to the quantum processors, gives you access to this uh, quantum virtual machine, which is a simulator for quantum processors. And then the, the software uh, stack on top of that includes some Python development tools and applications libraries to make it easier to develop uh, quantum applications. Uh, question of sort of why did we start up uh, this company now is related to several facts you've already heard uh, referenced earlier today. One is uh, a remarkable progress in uh, the coherence times of superconducting qubits uh, that have seemed to follow a nearly exponential trend uh, since uh, the first demonstrations around 2000, uh, as well as uh, maybe more importantly, a new class of, of quantum applications which use what's known as a hybrid computing model. So this is more like what you're familiar with with, uh, with using GPUs to accelerate a, a, a calculation but where the, the entire calculation is not entirely on the GPU. Here, the entire, al the entire algorithm is not entirely on the quantum processor, but we're only trying to offload parts of it. And so uh, 
this is an example of one such algorithm. Uh, actually, this is work from John's team uh, at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where they use what's known as the variational quantum uh, eigensolver to more efficiently take, take advantage of a quantum resource to, to measure uh, um, the binding energy of, of, of a molecule. So uh, this is my own version of, of this slide, which you've also seen several times today, uh, that looks at the, the importance of both error rates and number of qubits. Um, We've, we've already also heard today this reference to this, this idea of near-term intermediate scale, intermediate scale quantum computing. Um, and if, if I put where I think we are today, it's somewhere kind of at the boundary of where this, uh, this class of computation becomes useful. Something that I do think is, is a bit different, though, is, is that uh, you may be led to believe that uh, you have to get to this fault tolerant quantum computing regime to do anything useful with these devices. I, I would certainly uh, say that most of the things that we knew about before, like Shor Shor's algorithm for factoring, or uh, these large quantum simulation methods, finite element methods, uh, uh, really become uh, more powerful in this domain. But that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, uh, places where we can find value from the existing processors. And at Rigetti, we believe that people will find uh, quantum advantage, meaning that they will show that they can use this quantum resource to do a problem, solve a problem faster than they can with a classical resource uh, already in, in this uh, NISQ uh, domain. So the, the kinds of problems that, that we believe are in this domain are things like chemistry, uh, optimiza optimization, and machine learning. Uh, and where we think the field will be in roughly five years, or maybe even sooner, is kind of at the boundary of where uh, we can start doing these demonstrations, early demonstrations of fault tolerant quantum computing that, that really enable, uh, that really add error correction uh, to, the, to the types of devices we're building. So those applications that we think are in this near-term intermediate scale uh, quantum computing domain uh, are of several different flavors. Uh, some of them are related to machine learning and class classification. Uh, there's also optimization problems like MP-hard scheduling problems or traveling salesman's problems. Uh, these are maybe unusual things to claim that uh, a quantum resource would be useful for because, as already referenced by several earlier speakers, uh, for MP-hard problems, you don't expect more than a polynomial uh, speed up with a quantum resource. Um, but, uh, you know, these kinds of problems we actually have to solve in the classical world every day. And the way that we approach these NP-hard or NP-complete problems with, is with approximate methods. Uh, so uh, in that domain, where uh, we're actually not uh, comparing actually the total runtime, but maybe a more useful metric to compare is the, the approximation ratio, which is to say how close to the, to the best answer do we get using the, the methods that we have available. And this is where we think that maybe the, the quantum methods actually may provide uh, more fruit in the near term. Uh, that's in addition to also uh, uh, some material science problems uh, uh, like chemistry or, or electronic structure calculations, which may be amenable to these hybrid approaches. So uh, in order to take advantage of this uh, near-term intermediate scale uh, domain, almost all these algorithms that could, could effectively take advantage of that resource are effectively hybrid algorithms. So they are algorithms where, as I mentioned already, uh, are using the, the quantum processor as, as basically an accelerator. In some sense, they're algorithms that involve passing data back and forth between a classical resource and a quantum resource. And to make this possible, we've built a, um, a programming language called Quill. It's actually a machine uh, instruction language, instruction set, uh, that effectively uh, takes this, this data passing, this data transfer between quantum resource and classical resource uh, into the heart of the syntax of the language. So uh, we effectively make the kind of processing that you need to, for hybrid quantum classical computing, we make it easy. So to give you an outline of what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of my time, we'll take a, a brief look at our quantum processor. We'll look at how you program this device using our Forest API. And then we'll take a quick, quick look at solving uh, a problem, uh, an optimization problem. Uh, I'm sorry, solving a machine learning problem uh, with uh, the, the QPU. So this 19 qubit device uh, from the, the first, uh, first slide 
Uh, here with the cover removed, uh, it looks like this. It's a silicon chip. Uh, it's actually a fairly large chip, 19 millimeters on a side. And on this chip, you have a four by five lattice of, of qubits and, and resonators to read out the qubit states. Uh, if you do simple multiplication, you realize that four times five is 20, and this is a 19 qubit device. The reason for that is, is simple, that one of the qubits was out of spec. And so we, we uh, effectively turn off access to that, to that uh, qubit. Um, this is a, an arrangement of, an alternating arrangement of fixed frequency and tunable qubits with fixed capacitive coupling between them. Uh, if you zoom in on what it looks like, uh, our qubits are these kind of unusually shaped interlocking bumbel, uh, dumbbells, uh, and the, the couplers between them are these, these forks, these metal forks here. This bizarre sort of meandering thing with a box around it is the readout element that lets us uh, quickly interrogate the qubit state. Uh, so if you look at the effective geometry, though, of this thing, uh, you get a lattice that looks like this, uh, where here's our, our one qubit that's not usable, and then the, the colors show this arrangement of the fixed frequency and tunable qubits. So uh, this sort of choice is, is important for our way of, of turning on interactions in the device, uh, where we effectively modulate the tunable qubits at the difference frequency between it and one of its neighbors, and that uh, in uh, turns on an effective resonance condition which uh, causes the qubits to exchange energy. Uh, we can do this with error rates today which are uh, close to but not quite at the state of the art. So we have error rates that are somewhere between 5 and 15 percent depending on where, the, where it is in the lattice. Uh, that means that the usable circuit depth uh, in terms of the number of parallel t qubit gates you can uh, pile up in a circuit is somewhere between 8 and 10 which is, which is fairly modest. Uh, yep, as we'll see, uh, there's still enough to actually show uh, some, some very simple demonstrations. So how do you use this resource? So our, our Forest API uh, provides access to these two endpoints. Uh, there's the quantum virtual machine, which is a simulator. Uh, it's, it's ideal for, for testing your code, for de development, for answering questions of what is the ideal performance of, of an algorithm uh, in a case where there is no noise, there, is no, there are no errors. Uh, this uh, quantum virtual machine also gives access uh, to simple error models so that you can have uh, some idea of what the performance will be like when you actually move that same code to, to the, the real QPU. And then uh, the it also gives access to the 19 qubit uh, quantum computer. Uh, to use it, you just go to our website uh, and you sign up uh, for free. Uh, we'll email you an API key, and then this is a, our API is a Python package, so you just pip install PyQuill, which is a Python wrapper to the Quill programming language. Uh, and then, then uh, Grove is uh, what we call our application library, which I'll talk about in, in a couple minutes. So at that point, you're ready to go. Uh, you can write some uh, simple Python code to, uh, to create quantum states. So here's a, a simple Python program uh, that you create your program with a sequential series of, of gates. And these are effectively uh, describing uh, state transformations on, uh, on the quantum states. Uh, so here we're creating a mixture of uh, a, uh, a superposition state of qubits one and five, create, causing them to interact, and then uh, do another Hadamard gate on qubit five. And then you just uh, create a connection to the QPU and run it, and you uh, will get your results back. So you can get up and running very, very quickly. Um, when programming these machines, it's often, uh, we often, actually even talking about these machines in, in, uh, in general, we often highlight the mysterious aspects of, of these devices, right? They're, uh, they're spooky entanglement. There's uh, all kinds of bizarre, un hard to understand effects. Uh, but we try to actually separate what maybe seem like crazy physics involving lots of, uh, lots of hardware uh, and cryogenics, and room temperature electronics, uh, host, host, host machines. You know, some of these things where an individual component might represent 15 years of research or more. Uh, and we're hiding all that behind an abstraction layer, right? So that you are controlling all these resources with, you know, simple, uh, you know, a couple lines of code. Uh, but that's not enough. I mean, when you go to program today, right, you use, uh, you take, take advantage of an entire stack of software resources, right? Like, you can just 
add two integers and, and you don't have to think about how do I program addition on my, on my computer. Or uh, uh, maybe you're using sorting algorithms, right? Like everything you do with a computer today involves access to an incredible library of software tools that you didn't have to write yourself. And that's the only way you actually gain productivity. So to that end, uh, it's important to provide a similar library of, of building blocks that you can put together to, to solve your problem. So in this world where uh, hybrid uh, quantum computing uh, uh, is, the, is where we, we think it's likely to find advantage, the types of elements that are in our library are things that are geared towards uh, this hybrid model. So one algorithm uh, which we believe to be widely applicable, something known as the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Uh, this is actually a fairly recent algorithm. It was, just come, uh, it was just proposed in 2014. But this is something which uh, generically can, can find uh, ground states of, of, of graph problems. Uh, and so therefore it has applications obviously in graph theory, but also in machine learning. Uh, another uh, thing is this variational quantum eigensolver, uh, which uh, can be used for chemistry simulations. Uh, this is actually a nuclear uh, simulation that was done on both IBM's hardware and, and Rigetti's hardware uh, to compare the two. Um, and the important thing is that uh, if you want to use either of these on Rigetti's platform, you don't have to write these algorithms from scratch. Uh, you just uh, you know, import QAOA or you import VQE and you're, you're off and running. So, uh, Let's see what happens if you actually try to use these tools to, to solve a problem. So as an example, I would like to take a, an unsupervised machine learning problem, uh, which is clustering. So we're given an unlabeled data set, and we're given some metric, uh, which might be something like the Euclidean distance. And you want to uh, you know, label, uh, label these things into clusters. So uh, and you're going you're gonna to cluster them based on, some, on this on similarity based on that, that metric. So it could be like Euclidean distance. Um, so to solve that using uh, one of our, our library methods, we need to turn it into uh, an optimization problem. So the way we do that is that we consider the graph uh, that's formed by these points and where the, the edges of the graph are the, the, this distance metric. Uh, and then uh, if we recognize this as a, as a max cut problem, uh, which is to say we want to find the cut that separates the, this graph into, into two distinct regions where I'm counting the, the weight of, of those edges that cross the cut, uh, then the, the max cut solution is also a clustering solution. So uh, here I've, I've colored this graph uh, with, with the best, uh, with, with, the, with a label, labeling that gives the maximum cost, and, and that uh, would separate that original clustering problem. So we've we transformed a, a clustering problem into an optimization problem that is amenable to, to a solution with QAOA. So uh, I can't quite solve this graph yet, um, but I, I will solve a, a, a simpler graph, one that uh, uh, effectively matches the connectivity of, of the hardware. So this is a, a random graph uh, where I've chosen weights uh, with a, just a random number generator that matches the connectivity of the hardware. Um, that may seem like a silly thing to do, but in this particular case where I have only access to low depth circuits, that gives me an advantage that the effective circuit that I would write that, that is implemented by the, the QAOA algorithm effectively needs to, to apply a, a gate on every, uh, on every edge that would be in, in my graph of the, the problem instance. Um, and here, by choosing the problem instance to match the hardware, I get the, the shortest depth circuit possible. Um, but then when I actually run the QAO, QAOA algorithm, uh, it's an iterative algorithm, so it has uh, many trial steps. And then I, I watch basically the, the cost, which I've normalized in this case, such that the optimal cost is one. Uh, you can see that what happens is that over time, the, the, this QAOA algorithm does not in, indeed find the optimal solution in a, in a, in a, large, uh, pro, in a large percentage of the cases. If you run this many, many times, you can calculate statistics of how often you find uh, the best solution. And that would look something like this. So here is a function of the number of steps in, in the QAOA algorithm. Uh, you can see that after about 50 steps, I have about 70% probability of, of finding the optimal solution. And that's actually you know, running it on the actual quantum hardware. So how does that compare with uh, you know, how well did I do? Um, if you had a, an ideal quantum computer, would it do better? In fact, the answer is yes. So I can answer that simply by changing, instead of connecting to the QPU, connecting to the QVM, the simulator. 
And you can see that the, the QVM, which is in this, in this case simulating a perfect quantum computer, would find the answer faster and with higher probability. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we've, we've solved uh, a real problem uh, uh, with, a, with a quantum resource. Um, so, you know, there's lots more uh, to be done already with this resource today. Um, so we, we're uh, uh, looking at how to use this resource both uh, with our internal apps team as well as uh, through engagements with customers. Uh, our, uh, internally at Rigetti, we have people not just looking at uh, machine learning problems, but also quantum uh, um, chemistry uh, problems and find uh, electronic structure. Uh, we had a, a project in collaboration with Google uh, that provides a package that to, to efficiently uh, write down uh, essentially trial Hamiltonians for VQE. Uh, and also then with, uh, with our external partners, uh, we've now have several people have used our machine to demonstrate uh, other uh, things, such as uh, there's a group at Everedian that uh, trained a, a Boltzmann machine, uh, a neural network for a Boltzmann machine uh, with our simulator. Uh, a group at Oak Ridge National Lab uh, did this nuclear structure calculation that I was showing before. Uh, and then I got cut off here, but at Los Alamos, uh, uh, they were working on a, a novel machine learning approach. And this is all uh, with the actual hardware today. So uh, with that, I want to encourage you to, uh, you know, to explore these tools, uh, to sign up to get access to, to our, our, our QPU, uh, and start using it today. Uh, so thank you.